Hi all, so my name is Sabrina, but you can call me Beans. My pronouns are she, they, meaning that when you talk about me or to me in the third person, like she's wearing a shirt with a cuss word and they're at the podium kind of thing. Okay, cool. So welcome to Asian American and Pacific Islander Issues Conference. Woo! <laughs> okay, thank you all so much for coming out at 9 a.m. on a Sunday. Kudos to y'all. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> if it was me, I'd still be at home sleeping and curly on a sudden bed. But no, I'm excited to be here with y'all. Um, so a couple housekeeping rules. Um, if you haven't had the chance to, please sign up for the workshop blocks. The white pages are for um, workshop block one, and then the colored um, pages are for workshop block two. Um, and some of y'all have paper programs, but there's also a PDF version that was emailed to everybody last night. If you don't have access to that or a smartphone, please let me know and I will create new arrangements. Uh, we have four gender neutral bathrooms um, uh, upstairs and downstairs and it's accessible through the elevator, which is down the hall as soon as you get out of this door, as well as two um, women's restrooms and two men's restrooms. We will be using three of the centers downstairs thanks to the LGBTQIRC, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, intersex, asex resource center. It's early, y'all. And the Student Retention and Recruitment Center, as well as the Cross Cultural Center where I work. Um, I'm the Asian Pacific Islander. Um, community coordinator for the Cross-Cultural Center downstairs, and they are also the ones that helped fund for this conference. And we also have a couple of other folks from the other centers and other organizations here, so please mingle and learn more from other folks. Okay, other housekeeping stuff is, okay, we ran out of press releases, but if you don't want a picture taken of you, can you please draw a star somewhere on your name tag to indicate that you do not want to be taken in any photos. Does that sound cool with folks? Yeah? Okay, cool. But with that said, we also have a geotag snapshot filter, so get your social media out, as well as a really amazing poster, thanks to Philippine Nexus of Liberal Arts and Humanities, um, and a couple of other folks such as Jay, who is somewhere here. Yeah, Jay! It's, 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 amazing. it's really amazing. Okay, cool. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Colin! Yeah, Colin! <laughs> um, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, my name is Colin Masashi Ehara, and um, I'm really, really um, honored to be here. Um, I want to first and foremost, I want to thank uh, Sabrina so much for all the all the support and, uh, and everything, just like amazing communication throughout. Um, and I'm just really honored to be here. I also want to shout y'all out because as an undergrad, there's no way I would have made it to something this early on a Sunday. And particularly to my uh, my young people here, my students um, who are high school students, is that I would have I would have struggled mightily to make it out um, so early. We left from uh, from Richmond at seven in the morning. Um, I, um, I'm going to be talking today about uh, three things as they pertain to this theme of revolutionary uh, love, um, which I love. I, I, I love the uh, I love the the theme of this conference. And um, some of the research um, that I've done, both at San Francisco State uh, via my master's degree in, in ethnic studies and Asian American studies, and also at uh, USF um, in um, teaching urban education and social <laughs> justice. Um, I've, I've kind of uh, put together kind of a, an amalgamation of, of all those different things um, in combination with the work that I do every day with my young people um, in Richmond at, um, at Cal Prep. Um, and uh, there I am, at, I teach senior English and I teach eighth grade ethnic studies. And I'm going to be talking today about uh, suffering, self care, and sustainability um, using the metaphor of kintsu kuroi, which is um, a ceramic uh, Japanese traditional art form. Um, when it comes to uh, talking story, talking story is um, an indigenous Hawaiian term um, that also kind of uh, you can find pop up in, in almost every indigenous community. 
Um, my mother, I'm mixed heritage, and uh, my mother is uh, Haudenosaunee Mohawk, and uh, also a member of um, I Don't Know More. She teaches uh, Mohawk language. Um, and something that uh, our indigenous communities around the world kind of are striving to always do is to think about seven generations behind us from where we've come, um, and also seven generations forward. I um, mean, in that, um, Native Hawaiian folks uh, often use kind of oral tradition to talk, to, to talk about where they've come from, uh, where they are now, and where they hope to go. Um, and in that, um, when it comes to, particularly uh, in academia, a lot of what, what gets pushed upon us is this like fight to, to come off as objective and, and completely rational and devoid of any kind of feeling. And I actually have found in my life and in my research um, that uh, actually searching for subjectivity doing everything that we can to find our own biases and the, 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 the ways that our lived experiences have shaped who we are, actually does a lot more uh, to help us humanize ourselves and each other. Um, and so one thing that I often do um, is whenever I come across, whether it's a young person or adult, I try to imagine that young person as like an adult someday, as an elder someday. And when I come across um, elders, I try to imagine, you know, what was this person like when they were a young person? And I like to start off um, with kind of just showing uh, pictures from different pieces of my life up until now. Um, in the top left, me as a baby, moving towards um, the, the top right, um, that is my, uh, my childhood best friend, um, Jamari, who's a mixed heritage, South Asian and, and, and black, um, who unfortunately right now, due to different forms of, of institutional, ideological, interpersonal, internalized oppression, um, is currently serving um, a 27 year a prison sentence. Um, this is me in high school. On the bottom left, I went to El Cerrito High School. I was born and raised in Richmond, California. Um, me and my senior prime, me and my first year, um, DJing a party at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and then uh, about now nine years ago, um, I married my partner, Emily Lopez, um, Philippinex, Pinay, uh, born in the Philippines, um, amazing artist and educator. Um, and we live together with our family in El Cerrito. Um, when it comes to talking story, um, one of my favorite one of my favorite writers um, that I teach every year to my young people is uh, Sherman Alexi. Anybody here heard of Sherman Alexi? Already in this stuff? Yeah. So um, this comes from uh, this this picture on the left comes from uh, this young young adult novel called The Absolutely True Diary of a Part Time Indian. And um, although um, you know, I would argue that, uh, for instance, my Japanese American uh, context is very, very different um, than when, when compared to kind of the, the theft, the dispossession, the colonialism that Native and First Nations peoples have experienced on this continent. Um, that um, when I saw this picture, it, it, it blew my mind because of the ways that it so much resembled um, my kind of uh, mixed heritage identity and experience. Um, the ways that Japanese American internment. Um, and kind of those legacies had, you know, turned into um, varying and various forms of depression, suicide, alcoholism, um, diabetes, um, all of these different things. Bone crushing reality, a vanishing past, um, loss of culture and language, um, and the ways that my white family members, frankly, tended to live 10 to 20 years longer um, than, than my family of color. Um, and so uh, I wanted to start with um, a piece that I wrote, uh, I think maybe 12 years ago. Um, but it was named after um, this fictional autobiography by UC Santa, uh, Santa Barbara professor of art and Asian American studies, Kip Fulbeck. Um, and it was the first time I ever read a novel, um, fictional autobiography is what he, is what he calls it, um, where the protagonist was a mixed heritage uh, Asian American um, man of color. Um, this is Peyton Woods, and this is a piece of my talking story. It's nice to meet you. Well, Genki desu ka? I'm greeting you in Japanese, cause I am the Nihonjin, blood inside my sashi. The Yonsei Ombre Kamikaze, little boy whose crippled joy they burned to death in Nagasaki. Stole my wealth when Roosevelt uprooted me. I told myself, just go to your community. A woman crane whose bruised brain was locked up in a furnace. A choo choo train and troopers came and dropped me in internment. The no no boy, a sergeant in the 442nd, the poster boy for Dirty Jack up in the war, you remember. The kid you thought was good at math who learned to drive in cooking class. The nerdy herb with crooked glasses inside the looking glass. I'm taking all your jobs and why there's immigration laws. I serve your stars and sushi bars and build your cars for your applause. Uncle Sam, you can rock my war song, cause Japanese Americans are Nazi mock wrong. I hate it when they say I should. 
Spray the world with paper bullets, cause paper cuts for hatred could in. Make up for this racial bullsh. I hate it when they say I shouldn't. Spray the world with paper bullets, cause paper cuts for hatred could in. Make up for this racial bullsh. Hey, how's it going? This is all my Scottish blood. A race and label white with hatred, fright, and lack of love. I never wanted privilege if it meant my skin would have the pleasure to be set up as an infant to become a damned oppressor. Guilt consumes me, so at times I look away from the horror of filthy movie rated triple X I paid for in order. I don't want to be a cop, a judge, or a politician, but I benefit when any of them send a black man to prison. Listen, I'm beginning to understand. I'm giving the upper hand and privilege from Uncle Sam. It cripples me inside the ways I've lost my culture, so I nip at ethnic pride like a demonic vulture. I better remember the ones who got it better than ever made us hope to chase the blame away just like 11 September. If only for a day or know that I'm <coughs> Scottish and chop the lion's Highland's head like William Wallace. I hate it when they say I should spray the world with paper bullets. Cause paper cuts for hatred could in. Make up for this racial bullshit. Hey, I know it's hard to see me, but I'm still alive and kicking. Surviving sickness and all that genocide's afflicted. I'm kind as native blood, thin and hanging on for life. My skin's been light and cries been silent, sick and strangling all my life. Preparing you, I'm choosing to come clean because America diluted my bloodstream. And it's embarrassing, cause Lucifer's one thing, but American hysteria is abusive <coughs> and none. Clink, shoot me for loot to seize my emeralds. Yeah. Scoop me for wounded knee and general custer. My spirit flow ridiculous. No part retreating back. I'm Iroquois indigenous. Mohawk to be exact. Smallpox and fire water living in hell. Here locked in reservation like Leonard Peltier. Colin has to represent me through ridiculous rhymes. Cause if he don't want more indigenous dies. I hate it when they say I should. Spray the world with paper bullets. Cause paper cuts for hatred could in. Make up for this racial bullshit. The last samurai, the last king of Scotland, the last of the Mohicans rolled into one. My raps have to die like saplings in autumn. Cause everything's impermanent. It's over. I'm done. One. Thank you for listening. Um, here we have uh, Omni Wright, uh, my Jichan, my Bachan, and my father, Park Kiyoshi Ehara. Um, my grandparents, uh, my Japanese side, are they're both uh, Nisa, which means second generation. My father, Sansei, which makes me Yonsei, fourth generation. Um, uh, going from the left, that's my, my grandpa, my grandpa Bop, my granny Sydney. My grandpa Bop is a, a mostly Scottish heritage. Um, my granny is Palatine German, Haudenosaunee Mohawk. My mother is both, and um, these are my elders. Um, my frame of reference when it comes to positionality, my biases, my relationships to power and powerlessness, I identify as mixed heritage, miscegenated, East Asian American, and pigmentally challenged pale as person of color. I am Nikkei Yonsei, Scottish German, Haudenosaunee Mohawk, able-bodied, cisgendered, heterosexual, married man, he slash him, a U.S. citizen. I was raised working class uh, with ascension into the professional middle class. Growing up, um, my father uh, sold cash registers and cash registers. <coughs> And my mother was a um, was a secretary at Kaiser Oakland. Um, and um, as my mother uh, went back to school, um, she uh, eventually became a social worker. My father ended up um, becoming um, the officer of communications for the Richmond Unified School District um, in the East Bay. And he uh, worked at Richmond Unified Schools for uh, 23 years. Um, I'm a product of Richmond West Contra Costa Unified School District in the 1980s and the 90s. Um, so a lot of kind of seeing the, the, the causes and consequences of laws and public policies as they pertain to education and schooling um, under the Reagan, Bush, and Clinton administrations. Um, I, I can't really, I mean, many people much smarter than I have done you know, much more work around it uh, can point out all the different ways that uh, young people in Richmond and communities like Richmond have and continue to suffer because of these laws and public policies. Um, the unequal, unfair um, distribution of, of wealth and, and resources within different communities and the ways that um, our community has and continues to be underserved. Um, I identify as a partner, husband, son, brother, uncle, friend, comrade, colleague, mentor, mentee, cousin, community member, a former athlete. I have an exercise in like three minutes. I'm going to walk up my back hurts. Um, and an English and ethnic studies teacher. Um, when it comes to kind of my, my philosophical framework, my ways of being and seeing, so much of it has been informed um, by uh, these 
three frameworks. Okay, and so um, anybody ever seen this pyramid at the bottom? Ever anyone ever heard of Maslow's hierarchy of human needs? Some folks. So in uh, 1929, I believe it was, uh, Abraham Maslow, social psychologist, he puts together this framework, um, and he talks about that in order for a human being to become the best possible version of themselves, what he says is reaching self-actualization, um, they need their physiological and uh, psychological needs met. Right. So in order for anybody to uh, become creative to the point where we can uh, reimagine, synthesize ideas, um, create um, beautiful artistic expression, that um, like we need to be able to breathe. We need to be able to have water, and shelter, and clothing, and food. Um, and that uh, our, uh, our safety needs need to be met. Our uh, belongingness, we need a need to feel loved. Um, and, and esteem needs need to be met. Um, this is, is his argument. And kind of across the field, no matter what academic discipline you're looking at, you're going to find that uh, people pretty much agree um, that Maslow was at least onto something. Um, and every time that, because uh, I've worked with young people now for uh, close to 15 years in different, in different aspects, and every time, because I've never met a young person that didn't want to be successful in my entire life, and every time I see a young person struggling, I tend to go back to this. I tend to say, what is it, um, how can I figure out what it is that is under attack for this young person that they're not able to be the best possible version of themselves? And I do it for myself, too. When I'm not the best possible version of myself, if and when my ego is taking over and I'm like a funky, whack version of myself, I have to kind of sit back and be like, what is, what is, what is under attack for me right now? What am I struggling with? What do I need? Um, in the fourth grade, um, one of my childhood best friends, um, he's a, a Khmer Cambodian refugee in Richmond. Um, and um, his older brother was a part of a Richmond gang. And his older brother did something to somebody else in, a, in another uh, set. And um, when my friend was walking home, little fourth grader, um, out in front of his, uh, out in his neighborhood, um, one of these one of these uh, folks from a fellow from a fellow set saw him and in retaliation um, shot him in the head in, in, uh, in his community. Um, fourth grader, all right. And so um, uh, there was a there was a piece um, from a very very young age. That, uh, that deeply, deeply traumatized, wounded myself, our entire class, our entire community, our school, um, in the fourth grade. There was a, something, a very, very clear message, you are not safe. Um, and uh, the very same year, um, my, my godfather, um, he uh, was a queer, middle class white man. Um, he had contracted HIV, and he died of AIDS that, that year. Um, there were very, very crystal clear messages that I got over and over and over and over in every space um, and context that I operated in as a fourth, as a fourth grader, that um, this was a disease that people were afraid of, that people um, had labeled as a, as a gay disease, um, and that because of that, um, we're doing very little, if, if anything, to try to stop it. Um, the consequence of that is that today, the, uh, the, the group of people who are most likely to contract HIV are uh, heterosexual women of color, right? So kind of the ghosts of our, of, a, of our societies being unable or unwilling to address um, the heteronormativity, the homo antagonism um, has now kind of um, seeped out into, into different uh, pockets of, of, of our communities. Um, needless to say, um, I struggled mightily. Um, I couldn't sleep. Um, I you know, struggled mightily with anxiety, with depression, kind of constantly. And something that ended up happening very shortly after, in the beginning of sixth grade, was that I attended Adams Middle School in Richmond, and I met, uh, I met uh, a young man named Aaron Tanaka, who's still one of my, one of my closest friends. Um, and one thing that I was able to kind of do to, to kind of uh, practice self-care, escape in those moments, uh, was play basketball, right? So it's something that I did constantly. And he, uh, you know, saw that I was, uh, you know, that I was constantly out there. That I was also like one of the best um, basketball players in our grade at the time. And he asked me to come to, uh, to maybe play for the uh, Japanese American Berkeley Buddhist Temple church that he attended. And um, I decided to give it a go. And what ends up happening is that um, because uh, you have to attend a temple two times a month in order to stay on the team. Um, <laughs> I ended up really listening um, to some of these sermons. And uh, in these Dharma talks, 
a lot of kind of what really hooked me in was the ways in which Buddhism talked about suffering. Because at the time, I didn't really have a context. I was going to, at the time, a Protestant Christian church. And a lot of the messaging, whether it was implicit or explicit, at least in my church community there, was that uh, you weren't uh, maybe praying hard enough or your faith isn't strong enough. And it just uh, didn't click, click for me. It didn't make sense for me. Um, the, the German philosopher Goethe, he would say, there's my way, there's your way, but there's not the way. And I want to really put that out there, that this was my way. And that I do not, uh, uh, I do not uh, intend to kind of impress upon you that this is the only way. Um, but Jodo Shinshu Buddhism, um, in a nutshell, and uh, Aaron Tanaka's father, Reverend Ken uh, Tanaka, he came up with this really, really cool um, acronym that I like to think about when I think about Jodo Shinshu, and it's B-I-I-G. And so the first, the B is for that life is a bumpy road, that suffering is ingrained into the human condition. And then if and when we try to escape from it, uh, it's kind of a futile process. That it's more about, um, it's more about how do we uh, recognize uh, the difference between Useless suffering, like when I can't find my, my unsweetened van vanilla almond milk at Trader Joe's and I'm all mad about it, right? Or it's uh, useful suffering, getting up early to connect with people and, and be together in community, um, or, uh, or if it's unjust and unearned suffering, right? And so a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is with regards to unjust and unearned suffering. Um, the first I is impermanence, nothing lasts forever, that we need to cherish things. That, that we have in our lives, lives that are good, and not to sweat too much the things that are really, really uh, hurting us, because they won't be there forever either. Um, interdependence, and I feel like so much of the theme around revolutionary love is our understanding that our connections to each other and trying to grow those. And then finally, that life, we should, we should be searching for a good or a great life, and we shouldn't settle for anything less than that. Um, growing up, uh, born in 1982, and growing up in the 80s and 90s, um, no one was more kind of instrumental when it came to pop culture, when it came to growing up working class, when it came to growing up in a community like Richmond um, as a person of color um, in Tupac Shakur. Um, and the acronym, Richard Hinn, if you knew that he had a tattoo across his stomach that said Thug Life. A couple people, few people. Um, so Tupac, he had this, this tattoo across his stomach that said Thug Life. And the vast majority of people I know, even huge Tupac fans, don't know that it's an acronym that stands for the hate you give little infants fucks everyone. All right, so he he uh, he had a diagnosis for our society, right? And so so much of uh, of my pedagogy, and I use Tupac's work um, in my teaching. Um, so much of uh, Tupac's diagnosis was around um, that uh, thinking about um, the causes and the consequences of how we treat our young people. Right? And he referred to young people growing up in urban poverty as the roses that grow from concrete. And he talked about concrete as the material conditions of those who are experiencing the most unjust suffering. And that if and when you see a rose that's growing out of those conditions, that you don't question its damaged petals. Right? You say, wow, a, grow, a rose grew out of the concrete. Right? And so something that I'm constantly trying to always think about is if, if and when, whenever I come across a young person, how do I look at them not for the damaged petals, but for their will and their tenacity to reach for the sun? Um, when it comes to subjectivity, one of my favorite writers, Juno Diaz, he says, we all have a blind spot, and it's shaped exactly like us. And so I want to really speak to the ways that um, I have many, many um, gaps in knowledge. And I also want to note that even in this statement, right, that um, we have an ableist statement um, when we're talking about um, not being able to recognize things that uh, that were that were actually um, 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 in effect um, uh, degrading folks who are unable to, to visibly see and use their eyes, right? So even in trying to name our gaps in knowledge, we're capable of showing that we have gaps in knowledge. Um, one of uh, one of my, my close friends, David Scott. He's a, a poet and um, uh, an educator, a labor organizer. He born and raised in Sacramento. Um, he he really, really, I think, has helped me to think deeply about trigger warnings. And the first thing that he he kind of says is he says, I think my first instinct when it comes to trigger warnings is to assume people have experienced traumas deeper, more lasting, more intricate than my own, and begin trying to imagine the size and scope of that feeling outward where my traumas have, suffer have suffocated me the most. Uh, so tying this feeling of like not being able to breathe and move. 
says, I remember those times where I felt claustrophobic in public space, where someone was trespassing upon my own private territory, raising old chains around my lungs. A paralysis I couldn't even write my name for how bereft of my faculties it left me. It left me feeling as dumb as the initial trauma insisted I was. It says, when people reawaken those dynamics, they stand on the side of whomever ripped open the initial wound. I think that's the thing about trigger warnings, why I support them as an idea. To acknowledge someone's oppressors may be in the room right now, and I may be unwittingly be giving them power, but I don't stand on their side. And so, I want, with all that said, I want to I want to say that that a that I don't stand on the side of your oppressors and anyone that has um, harmed you in the past. And at the same time, I need to acknowledge that my gaps in knowledge, whether even if, even if I have good intentions, um, I may potentially still unknowingly trigger folks here uh, in my talk today. Um, and which leads me to my other dear friend, Candace Valenzuela. Um, she is an educator, artist, mother, healer um, uh, uh, in Oakland, California. And when it comes to trigger warnings, she also adds that in all the discussion and growing awareness around triggers, we can forget the triggers can be catalysts for change. A trigger is an internal, subconscious effort to heal an alarm. It's the internal canary in the mind body saying, hey, come look, there's something still here for you to see. This still stinks, still hurts, still haunts or terrifies us, makes us feel small. We should certainly hope to live without being triggered constantly by avoiding painful situations and heeding or giving trigger warnings. But the only way to be truly free of triggers is to face them, to listen to the alarm and what it's trying to communicate. Um, and I really appreciate, I was looking in the, the, uh, the program and I, and I saw that one of the kind of community agreements was to try to lean into discomfort. Because I don't know about y'all, but I've never once in my life grown without some form, form of, of discomfort. Um, in the words of one of my mentors, uh, Alison Tentianco Kubala, so that's that state, um, pain plus love equals growth. Which brings us to Kintsu Kuroi. This is uh, the title of my talk, and I'm going to be talking about uh, three different things in regards to Kintsu Kuroi. Kintsu Kuroi um, is uh, um, a, a form of Japanese pottery of ceramics. And um, kintsu kuroi or kintsugi is another is another is another way to call it. Um, means to repair with gold. Um, the art of repairing pottery with gold or silver lacquer and understanding the piece is more beautiful for having been broken. So I'm going to be kind of using this uh, this analogy of kintsu kuroi to talk about breaks and shards. So the historical trauma and amnesia around that trauma. Um, precious lacquer versus rusty staples. Effective and ineffective uh, intervention when it comes to addressing those things. And then finally, Kintu Kuroi being the reparation um, of ourselves, of our communities, um, and revolutionary love. Um, so I begin with uh, with suffering. All right. So today we're going to be talking about suffering, uh, self-care, and sustainability. Begin with suffering. These are the breaks and shards. Um, in psychology, um, kind of this uh, this metaphor of the broken, of the shattered vase. Um, is used to kind of describe when traumatic ha uh, moments happen in our lives and, and afterwards the ways that we, we have to pick up the pieces. When it comes to our communities, um, as it pertains to peoples of Asian and Pacific Islander heritage, um, these are the three that I would argue are kind of the most uh, uh, pressing in our experiences. And, and they are Orientalism, Colonialism, and War. Um, General William Westmoreland, uh, United States uh, General during the Vietnam War, said the Oriental doesn't put the same high price on life as does a Westerner. Life is plentiful, life is cheap in the Orient. Um, we've literally been, been named as people who do not value life. Um, and that, uh, and that, that our lives, that we consider them to be cheap. Um, Edward Said, um, who wrote this book, the literal book on, on Orientalism, he, see, he, uh, he says that Orientalism can be discussed and analyzed as a corporate institution for dealing with the Orient. Dealing with it by making statements about it, offering views of it, describing it by teaching it, settling it, by ruling over it. In short, Orientalism as a Western style for dominating, restructuring, and having authority over the Orient. This, uh, in so many, in so many terms, is um, the dominant narrative that gets to tell uh, our stories for us, where we don't get to say what our stories, our lived experiences, um, have and continue to be. That they get told uh, for us um, and not by us. Um, Warner Brothers, uh, relatively recently, has put out this series of, of movies. Uh, 300, it's called 300. Um, it tells about the, the, uh, the Greek battle of the Thermopylae. Um, and 
apparently, if you are like a monster or a goat that plays a centaur or a person of color, um, that you're a Persian um, in this case. But this is, a, I thought, particularly recently as it pertains to Orientalism and a dominant narrative, telling the story of kind of this otherization, um, painting uh, Asian Pacific Islander uh, people as perpetually foreign, as culturally dysfunctional, as uh, queer in the, in the very uh, literal sense of the word, um, as it pertains to like the dictionary. Um, and also the different ways that, um, that um, all the different forms of, of facets of identity, be it uh, race, class, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, um, nationality, religion, that these different things, the ways that uh, our, our narrative get, has get, gotten painted. Um, Marco Polo, in his, in his, uh, in his travels, um, literally, you can, you can look it up. He talks about the different ways that he saw uh, on his, in his travels to the Orient, that he saw um, people with the heads of beasts and the bodies of, of human beings. All right? So these narratives don't come from, from nowhere. Um, in thinking about colonialism, Winston Churchill um, viewed uh, in every history class I ever took in high school as kind of this hero. Um, as somebody who was very, very great at recognizing the humanity of European Jews, which is true. Um, he, did, he did a lot to combat uh, the terrorism, the targeted destruction of Jewish people during World War II. And uh, at the same time, it's also important that we, that we include the, the, the counter narratives to that. So not that we eliminate that story, right, but that we add um, kind of his views on Palestinian people at the same time. And uh, Winston Churchill, uh, who once said, the sun never sets on the British Empire. He said, I do not agree that the dog in the manger has the final right to the manger, even though he may have lain there for a very long time. I do not admit that right. I do not admit, for instance, that a great wrong has been done to the Red Indians of America or the black people of Australia. I do not admit that a wrong has been done to these people by the fact that a stronger race, a higher grade race, a more worldly wise race, to put it that way, has come in and taken their place. So when we think about uh, dehumanization, I often think about it in terms of horns and halos. And so that it's not just kind of the ways that people, human beings are demonized. It's also the ways that people get put up on pedestals as being kind of perfect, um, heroic, and uh, uh, without any without, uh, without fallacy. Um, anybody here ever seen the Jerry Bruckheimer so, uh, Pearl Harbor. Okay. So what we're going to do, uh, just for a quick moment, is we're going to take a quick look at the dominant narrative, um, particularly as it pertains to uh, World War II and relationships um, between Japan and the United States. Via the trailer from the 2001 um, blockbuster uh, hit, uh, Pearl Harbor. Thank you. 
Um, as it pertains to the dominant narrative around World War II, specifically as it pertains to uh, Pearl Harbor and Hawaii um, and December 7th, um, this is, a, I would argue, a great example of, of the dominant narrative um, in our country today. Um, there is a, an artist, manga artist, named Keiji Nakazawa. And Keiji Nakazawa is a, was a survivor of uh, the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. And um, he uh, spent uh, his life after that creating a series called Barefoot Gen. Um, Barefoot Gen is about, uh, roughly about his experience, but it also kind of incorporates the, uh, the many different narratives of different people that were in his life into the life of this young boy, Gen, and who grows up um, in Hiroshima after the bomb, bomb has been dropped, and, as, and also after the occupation of the US military coming into Hiroshima. Um, I want to warn folks that even though this is animated, um, it's very, very graphic. If you want to look away or close your eyes, that is totally okay. But this is um, a, uh, what I would say is the dominant narrative in Japan, um, and a counter-narrative here in the United States as it pertains to World War II. on target, release bomb. We're on air, releasing bomb. San Francisco State um, was was a, was titled "Strangers from a Different War," and um, it was a, it was both a nod to Ronald Takaki's um, 
you know, really like a really groundbreaking work around Asian American history, Strangers from a Different Shore. Um, but also, the different ways, the more I research and look back um, into our different histories, um, the more I begin to realize the role that, that war, Orientalism, and colonialism played in the push-pull factors of why we were here in the United States today. Um, that I would argue that the vast majority, if not every person in this room, has some sort of connection uh, to Orientalism, war, or colonialism, bringing their families here. Um, and when it comes to looking at things like General William Westmoreland's statement about our not valuing life, um, and then seeing a counter-narrative like this, and when we're thinking about the value of life. Um, my, my, my hope and my aim is that it continues to bring up questions for us, um, even if we have to sit in uh, discomfort, heartbreak, um, uh, feeling enraged. Um, when it comes to trauma, um, from some of my research, uh, this is a working teacher definition, so this is kind of always shifting, but trauma is a highly stressful and impactful experience in which, one, the body's nervous system is overwhelmed, fight, flight, freeze, deployed, but ineffective. The mind's ability to rationalize reason is undermined, causing a long-term shift in worldview, the way that you see the world. The emotional center is depleted, depressed or overstimulated, a spiritual crisis ensues. Some aspect of self is disconnected from the present moment. Um, when my bacha, my grandmother, was in a, um, a teenager in the, uh, the Japanese American internment camps, bless you, one of, uh, one of the elders, an old, old uh, oji-san, old man, um, who was, who was deaf, because um, he, was, he was probably, I think, in his late 70s, early 80s. Um, he had a little dog, and the little dog ran away and went towards the fence and was starting to scurry under the barbed wire fence. Um, and this old man goes after his little puppy, and one of the guards in the guard tower yells at him, get away from the fence, get away from the fence. Um, because he's deaf and he can't hear, he doesn't move. Um, and in front of the entire community, um, the guard uh, shoots and kills this elder in front of everybody. Um, this is a story that um, before my Bachan passed away, um, she told me um, when, I, when I was interviewing her. And I could tell that it was bringing up something that felt incredibly painful for her, uh, incredibly awful, horrific. And at the same time, that there was some piece that I could tell she felt lighter after having shared it um, with me. Um, Historical trauma in social work refers to a cumulative emotional and psychological wound extending over an individual lifespan and across generations caused by traumatic experiences. The historical trauma response is a constellation of features and reaction to this trauma. Um, the historical trauma response may include substance abuse as a vehicle for attempting to numb the pain associated with, with the trauma. The historical trauma response often includes other types of self-destructive behavior, suicidal thoughts and gestures, depression, anxiety, low self-esteem, anger, and difficulty recognizing and expressing emotions. Associated with historical trauma response is historical unresolved grief that accompanies the trauma. Um, I can't tell you um, how deeply um, alcoholism, gambling, um, eating really, really terribly um, has impacted my family in different ways that uh, the legacy of the internment camps um, hasn't continued to produce negative health outcomes. Uh, for those uh, emerging from that particular experience. Um, the second piece I'm talking about today is self-care. Okay? So when it comes to uh, event, uh, intervention and working to heal as, as individuals and as a community and as communities, um, the, uh, the part of the Kintsu Kuroi story that I ne neglected to tell at first was that um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the shogun uh, at the time um, in the 1800s, um, there were a set of teacups that came from China as a present, um, and when they when they when they were received, they were broken um, on on kind of a, through the through the travels had gotten cracked, and so um, uh, they were sent back and asked to be repaired, and they came back with uh, with rusty staples, in them. and so sometimes like the tea would even seep out, it didn't really work. Um, what ends up happening is at least legend says that the uh, that the artisans uh, within within the within the shogunate at that time. Um, decided to try this technique using uh, silver and gold lacquer and created uh, Kim Soo Kuroi. Soo Kim Sik is a Zainichi Korean scholar. Uh, if you're not familiar, Zainichi folks are uh, Korean 
uh, ancestry, uh, Korean heritage folks who, who are born and raised in Japan. There's a long history of Zainichi people being treated like second class citizens, being dehumanized by the Japanese government. Um, and one thing that Suk Kyung Sik says is he says, culture is an expression that emerges from the pain of being deprived of culture and then being labeled as lacking culture. So having your ways of being and seeing stolen, robbed from you, your traditions robbed from you, and then having people point the finger at you and saying, like, look, you have nothing. Um, anybody here like spam, musubi? All right. So uh, if uh, spam has ever played a role in your life, in what you've eaten, it's very likely that you have connections to a history of colonialism, orientalism, and war. Um, the, uh, this, is, this is usually referred to as like a, a Hawaiian food. Right? And so if we think about um, the, you know, the, the ways in which uh, militarization brought in uh, pro highly processed, packaged uh, meat, Vienna sausage, right? uh, corned beef, all these different things that you know, I'm still trying to remove from my diet, but I'm not fully there yet, um, that, uh, that these, these are things that, are, that, are, uh, that I would argue are, are uh, rusty staples. Right? So these are, these are the pieces of, of, uh, of, of our cultures that you know, uh, I grew up eating Spam because Spam was something that came into the Japanese internment camps right, and became part of our staple uh, diet. Um, I also want to add that, uh, in the words of Audre Lorde, the queer feminist uh, black scholar, she says that caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. Um, I also, at the same time, want to recognize that uh, I'm not Audre Lorde. I, I have a plethora of different privileges um, that you know she did not, and uh, I say that only because you know I also want us to be self-critical around the ways that like say my um, uh, instead of going to the gym or going to uh, an organizing meeting, um, my staying home drinking beer and playing video games, mm -hmm. I wouldn't argue that's an act of political warfare, right? So <laughs> always good for us to be uh, self-critical in the ways that we frame uh, self-care. Um, Yashma uh, Adamsi um, is a first generation South Asian immigrant, queer femme, healer, warrior, yoga teacher, who was raised uh, in part in the US South. And she works with love and care for the National Domestic Workers Alliance as an administrative coordinator. Um, and I really appreciate what she talks about when she talks about self care. She says, Why do we need care in the first place? There's a growing rumble of yearning for healing in our movement work. Oppression and trauma do influence our well being. Ongoing generational trauma and violence affect our communities, our bodies, our hearts, minds, and spirits. Racism, sexism, classism eat at our very beings. This leads us to seek care. We know this. Our bodies know this. Our friends can read it in our faces, even if we have learned to ignore it. We put our bodies on the line every day because we care so deeply about our work. Hunger strikes, long marches, long days at the computer, or long days organizing on the street corner, or a public bus or congregation. Skip a meal. Keep working. Don't sleep. Keep working. Our communities are still suffering, so I must keep going. We risk and test our bodies to go further, and we stretch our hearts uh, or, or close, close our hearts to keep going, whatever it takes. And ultimately, what it takes is a toll on us, and this leads us to seek care. Um, when it comes to sustainability, the last thing I'm going to be speaking on, repar uh, reparations, implications for the future, um, and revolutionary love. Okay. Um, the big piece around sustainability that uh, Yashma Pat, uh, Padamsi also talks about is community care right, and its relationship to revolutionary love. Um, and so, in the same vein, a Suk Kyung Sik saying culture is an expression that emerges from the pain of being deprived of culture and being labeled as lacking culture. Um, this is my homie J.R. Pugao. Um, he owns a uh, Filipino vegan food truck. So he, he takes traditional Filipino foods and recreates them as vegan and really, really healthy. Um, and uh, you know, he talks about the different ways that he's trying to decolonize the diet of Filipino uh, folks um, and recreate uh, kind of a new trajectory forward as far as self-care goes. Um, anybody here a fan of Kendrick Lamar? Woo. Like Kendrick Lamar, right? Another wonderful example of people being uh, having culture uh, taken away and then being labeled as lacking culture, but recreating beautiful, amazing, critical um, art, heart work. Um, when it comes to historical intergenerational healing, 
um, Lacana and Weaver argue the treatment of historical trauma must repair connections with others, self-image, values, and beliefs. It takes the forms of individual counseling and therapy, spiritual health, and group or entire community gatherings uh, that, are, that are all important aspects of the healing process. It aims at a renewal of hope, positive self-image, and spiritual beliefs, renewal of family connections, and reaffirming one's place in the human community. Um, Yashna Padamsi, she adds, after talking about why we seek to, to, to uh, seek care, she says, if we let ourselves be caught up in the discussion of self-care, we're missing the whole point of healing justice work. She says, talking only about self-care, when talking about historical justice, I'm sorry, healing justice, is like only talking about recycling and composting when speaking on environmental justice. It is necessary, uh, it is a necessary, important individual daily practice, but truly seek justice for the environment, or to truly seek healing for our communities, we need to interrupt and transform systems on a broader level. We need to move the self-care conversation into community care. We need to move the conversation from individual to collective, from uh, the independent to the interdependent, right? bringing me back in my own mind uh, to Jodo Shinshu and these reminders around the, our connectedness. So, too often, self-care in our organizational culture gets translated to our individual responsibility to leave work early, go home alone, go take a bath, go to the gym, eat some food, and go to sleep. So we do all that quote unquote self-care to return to organizational cultures where we reproduce the systems we are trying to break, where we continually are reminded of our own trauma or exposed and absorbed secondary PTSD, and where uh, we then feel guilty or punished for leaving work early the night before to take a bubble bath. Self-care as it is framed now leaves us in danger of being isolated in our struggle and our healing Isolation of yet another person, another injustice is a match in available pressure. A liberatory, a liberatory care practice is one in which we move beyond self-care and into caring for each other. Uh, and again, bringing kind of full circle around healing when it comes as it pertains to pushing back against amnesia and thinking about uh, historical trauma. Particular attention is given to the needs and empowerment of people who are vulnerable, oppressed, and living in poverty. Social workers promote social justice and social change within and on behalf of clients who include individuals, families, groups, organizations, and communities. It depends on the social worker's understanding of cultural diversity, history, culture, and contemporary realities of clients. Searching for subjectivity. What is my bias? What is my lived experience? Where are the places where I don't know everything? Where are my gaps in knowledge? How can I learn more? Um, and somebody who I think does an amazing job at this, uh, I don't think I have enough time to, to play the actual video, but I will speak briefly that uh, Scott Nakagawa, uh, Japanese American um, uh, organizer and educator from Hawaii, um, has done amazing work as it pertains to uh, confronting anti-black racism um, in uh, the a AAPI community. Um, and he talks about white supremacy, right? And he talks about the fulcrum of white supremacy, right? And you see the little diagram. That the fulcrum of white supremacy, he says, is anti-black racism. And that if and when we are able to eliminate anti-black racism, that white supremacy will fall. That if we look back to the history, particularly the context of the United States, that the better things have gotten um, for, for black people in the United States, that the better things have gotten for all people of color. And generally, I would argue for all people. Because of the ways that anti-black racism is rooted um, in enslavement, right? and in, in the ways that that economic system uh, perpetuates and reproduces white supremacy. Um, another scholar's work who I love very much as it pertains to thinking about community care um, and healing justice is uh, Angelo Enchetta, a Filipino scholar, um, was at Santa Clara, I believe, is now at Berkeley, I could be wrong, though. but he, his research was about, uh, was about hate crimes, right, and so according to the LA District Attorney's Office, a hate crime is a crime motivated by racial, sexual, or other prejudice, typically, typically one involving violence. And, uh, just want to remind that this is this is something that's been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. So there are many times when this has taken place and gone unnoticed, <coughs> unreported, or uh, um, not not brought to not brought to justice. Um, and for this this last activity, um, the kind of working definitions I, I use with my students for culture are simply just ways of being and seeing. Many times culture gets conflated with race, but my young people remind me all the time that there's hip hop culture, there is skater culture, there is youth culture, there is Bay Area culture, um, but it's not always uh, conflated with race. Okay. Um, functional, meaning operating sustainably and properly within a specific context. And so 
the question that, um, that I want to kind of uh, have us be thinking about as we look at this is what is considered functional and dysfunctional and American and un-American given the context of the dominant narrative in the United States today. Um, Angelo Anchetta, in his research, he found that, the, uh, that overwhelmingly 90% uh, of hate of racially motivated hate, hate crimes targeted uh, black folks. And that uh, anti-black racism was a driving force in, in uh, violence against, uh, against people of color, specifically black people. Um, and when he interviewed folks who had committed these crimes, it was because there was this, there was this running kind of a line of thinking that, uh, that to be black meant that you were culturally dysfunctional, that you were prone to criminality, you were prone to being violent. Really ironic when you consider who's actually experiencing the crime and the violence. Um, he also added this other axis. And you see it says American at the top, foreign at the bottom. And they're all in quotation marks because this is all about perception. Okay? All of these things, um, you know, we have different uh, kind of ways we understand these things depending on our lived experience. But he identified that uh, people of color who are not black, who are not racialized black, um, when they were targeted for violent hate crimes, that it was because they were perceived as perpetually foreign, not real Americans. Right? And so for him, as a Filipino scholar, he identified the different ways that, um, it, even within his own research, the ways that he had been identified as never being a real American, always being perpetually foreign, strange, different. Um, and these are some media representations of who gets put into different categories. Right? And when I ran this, uh, this exercise uh, a bunch of years ago, I was an after school uh, program uh, uh, tutor and also a um, basketball coach, sixth grade boys basketball coach. We won that year. Um, but one of my point guards, um, his name was Khalil, he, when we did this, he goes, hey coach, what about Native Americans? And I was like, this is what you always do, you just throw it back. What do you think, right? And then so, so he goes, well, you know, I think they go right in the middle. And I said, okay, like, Khalil, why, why do you think that? He's sixth grade, super, super sharp. Um, I said, why do you think that? And he says, well, you know, I think a young African American kid. And he said, he said, well, I think that, um, you know, when people think of Native Americans, they think that like they're they're like culturally dysfunctional, but like not as much as, as black people. And I think that um, when people think of like uh, Native Americans, they know that they're not foreigners, but if they hear people hear American, that's not the first thing they think of. Right? I was like, wow, I, I appreciate that analysis. Clear, like, what, like, you know, what does it mean if like you're not all the way this way, this way, this way, this way? And he said, I think it means that no one's thinking about you and that you're invisible. Right? Um, sixth grader to this day, I, I love telling the story and remembering that moment. Um, but. Um, Sabrina, yes. how much time? How much time are we looking at? I know that we pushed back a little bit. About ten minutes. Cool. So, um, this is uh, anybody heard of illiteracy? So cool. So a lot of the members of this really amazing uh, hip hop spoken word uh, music artist collective. Um, um, a few of them uh, are alumni of UC Davis, and um, there's some friends of mine. One of them, who you'll see here, who you see here, is uh, his name is Nico Carey. And Nico, in his senior year at UC Berkeley, did kind of a social experiment with uh, his other member, uh, Adriel Adriel Lewis, who is a Taiwanese um, American um, educator, artist, kind of jack of all trades. But the two of them did. Um, kind of a social experiment as it pertains to uh, Nico's being mixed heritage, Chinese and black, um, uh, when it came to being Asian American um, on UC Berkeley's campus. And uh, I'll let him tell his story. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nico Carey. I'm a fifth year super senior at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, um, that means I've been going here for five years. I'm black and Chinese. Now, in my five years going to UC Berkeley, I have not once been flyered to by any of the Asian American student organizations, fraternities, or sororities. Um, and I've always wondered, you know, is it because I look black? Filipino, 